So we're talking about the parables of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, perhaps you've heard of him. Uh, he's referred to as many things, but one of which is the greatest teacher of all time. And the way that he taught was through parables. And parables, as we defined last week, a very simple definition is simple stories with profound meanings. And, and these parables, in fact, are all over the Gospels. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. And in those three Gospels alone, it seems like every page you turn, you will bump into one of these parables. In fact, 55 in total in just those three Gospels, like one after another, one after another, we see these simple but profound stories that Jesus told. And the story that we're looking at uh, last week and this week, we'll look at some more in the coming weeks, is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. And I explained this last week. Don't think sewing machine, think farmer, okay? And this is what Jesus is doing. He is taking something culturally relevant and he's teaching this audience in the first century of something they knew quite well, which was farming. And so he tells this story and he actually tells it. It's pretty amazing. It's recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, only three parables of the 55 are recorded in all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this parable is one of the three. Uh, the reason that's a big deal is because this really provides a window into the early church and how important they believed this parable was to help us understand the, the kingdom of God and God, Jesus Christ, our King. And so the parable of the sower, I mean, if this were an album, this would be triple platinum. This is such an incredible story. And last week I summed up really the entirety of that story in, in one statement. And that was so boldly search honestly, so boldly. And that means to scatter the seed of God, the love of God, the word of God, the gospel of grace. Let's be bold in this. Let's not hold back. Let's be liberal with how much seed we sow. Let's sow boldly. And at the same time, let's make sure that we search honestly. Let's make sure that we are searching inside to see what kind of hearts that we have. Now, I want to read to you again this parable. And what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of take this zoomed out lens and really zoom in. And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the four soils. And, and as I read this and you hear about these four different types of soil, I want you to know that uh, what Jesus is really meaning is the soil represents your heart and my heart as well. And so if you're there, let, let's go ahead and read this. We're in Mark chapter four. We'll start in verse three. Here we go. Jesus said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still, check this out, other seed fell on, say it with me, fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. If you can, during your own time this week, you could skip down and you can read verse 13 through 20. Because there you will find something very unique to this parable. In fact, it's the only parable of all the parables Jesus told that he went on to explain. Again, this provides a window into the importance of the parable of the sower. Jesus explains what he meant as he taught this story. But what I want us to do today is uh, to kind of move from focusing on the farmer and the seed to the four soils, the four soils. And for us to understand the four soils, which um, are really speaking to the diff four different uh, conditions of our heart, uh, I've named them that I think will probably help you understand a little bit more. At least it has me. So uh, I have four names for these four different types of hearts. Uh, there is the calcified heart, the crowded heart, the conflicted heart, and lastly, the cultivated heart. And so let me just kind of step through each of these. The, the first kind of person uh, the first kind of heart Jesus speaks about is the calcified heart. Uh, this person, and it could be you right now that are watching it, uh, it's been me on many occasions. It's, it's the person whose heart has become hard. And Jesus, when he told this story, he's the master storyteller. He said the farmer was just sowing seed and some of that seed, it fell along the path. 
Uh, I don't know if you've walked around recently outside. A lot more people have been walking around outside getting their, their vitamins. And if you have, um, I walk all the time with my dog. And uh, most times it's not many of us that are walking outside. So the paths have been overgrown. But over the past few months, so many people now are walking. And I found that these paths that used to be pretty overgrown are actually hard. And they've actually been like walked on top of. And that's what Jesus is getting at. He's saying there, there are some folks, the, the condition of their heart is, is like a, a well-worn path. And if you keep walking over that path long enough, that path becomes as hard as concrete. Some of you right now that are watching this, that is indicative of your heart. It really speaks to the kind of heart that you have right now. Your heart is hard. And here's what I know about a hard heart. It didn't happen on accident. Uh, I found, at least in my life, the, the days or weeks when my heart has become hard, it's generally for a reason. Uh, a lot of times in, in my life, it can be sin. I know this is amazing that a pastor is admitting publicly that he sins. I do. Uh, I really do. Uh, so it's, at times it can be sin. Uh, it can be things that I've done. A lot of times it can be things that others have done to me. Uh, it can be pain. It can be times where I've been mislabeled or people have said things about me, and, and quite frankly, it's hurt. It, it's hurt deeply. And what has happened many times in my life, if I'm not careful, is my heart becomes hard. Jesus tells this story, and I think it's so important for us to understand that, uh, that these aren't fixed conditions of the heart. Now, what I mean by that is I can, I can, in any week, I can actually possess all four of these types of conditions of the heart. I really can't. And what he starts with is saying, some of you that are listening today, your, your heart is hard. It's become calcified. We get hardened by our own sin or perhaps by the sin of others. Uh, some oftentimes think that with age comes growth. And I want you to know that's actually not true. Uh, with age, if you're not careful, can actually come bitterness, can come even more of a hard Heart. We got to be so careful. We got to do inventory. We got to look within and we got to see is our heart growing calcified or is it becoming soft? The second condition of, of the heart, which Jesus is using as soil, is that of a crowded heart. Uh, these are folks that listen to the gospel, they even get inspired by it, but there's just no room for the gospel to take root. The seed is crowded out by other things. Our hearts dictate our affections and our desires and our pursuits. This is true. When my heart is crowded, the seed of grace can't compete with my misplaced affections. He begins to talk about this kind of soil that's just really shallow. And he says there's, there's rocks there. And I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced this when you've been walking outside and you've seen what looked like to be like a really strong tree. But if you go over to it and you just kind of lightly pull up on it, you can actually pull it up by the roots. And the reason is, is because there's really no root system. It can't go much deeper than that. And he's saying there's some of you, your hearts are, are crowded You've allowed, whether consciously or subconsciously, so many competing loves in your heart. Uh, this has been, and if I'm not careful, this can continue to be true of my life. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> and if I am not careful, man, my heart can just crowd out the seed that is the grace and word of God. And Jesus, the master storyteller, he says, this is not what I have in mind for your life. If you would have ears to hear, would you do the hard work of doing the inventory to see what kind of heart do you really have? Perhaps it's calcified. Maybe it's crowded. Thirdly, it can be conflicted. I, I think the, the pandemic has been, if anything, a great revealer of our actual hearts. I, I think some of the painful moments for you and perhaps for me and, and many that are watching right now have been the moments where we've recognized just how conflicted our hearts really are. We've been aware of the war that wages within this war of lordship. There's only one worthy king of our heart, of course, and that's Jesus Christ. And yet there's so many competing kings, lower case K, that want to trump and, and dethrone the, the one 
rightful king of our hearts, Jesus Christ. And, and for some, if you're watching right now, as I'm even saying this, you're like, man, yeah, I think that condition is true of my heart right now. You might say your heart is conflicted. He even gives the examples, Jesus says, of money and, and riches, the, the things of this world that always overpromise, yet continue to underdeliver. Um, at church, we at times will talk about money. And uh, I, I hate it more than anyone because it's, it's always really uncomfortable. Uh, I can feel it in the room, the amount of tension uh, that people are like, oh my gosh, I invited a friend and now he's talking about money. And, and the interesting thing is Jesus, he talked about money and possessions more than anything else besides the kingdom of God. And yet he didn't live in a palace. Uh, his chariot was not like souped up. Uh, he, he really didn't have a place to lay his head. Yet he talked over and over and over about money and possessions. Why is it? It's because your possessions have the tendency of possessing your heart. It's, it's that kind of condition. It's, it's a conflicted heart. And you were made to worship. The question is never, are you worshiping? The question is who? And Jesus is saying, listen, the farmer, he is sowing seed and the seed is so powerful and as that seed lands on a heart, if it is also allowing conflicting gods, competing counterfeit gods, there's just only so much growth that's going to happen. And yet there's, there's a fourth condition of the heart. This last condition, I like to refer to it as a cultivated heart. Uh, some of you are into gardening and uh, you're proud of that. You love to post pictures on Instagram and Facebook of your garden. It's a place where you're restored. You just love to dig in the dirt. And if that is you, if you're a green thumb, you would know that, man, there are a few things that get you more excited than a fresh cultivated garden where the soil, and especially here in Illinois, some of you are watching this in other states, but the soil here in Illinois is actually amazing. Uh, it's because, you know, one of the reasons we have so much corn everywhere, the soil, it's this beautiful, like incredible cultivated soil. And there's just no limit to what can grow in that kind of soil. And Jesus says the same can be true of your heart, that the seed has been sown, it's been scattered. And, and some of that seed, it falls on the kinds of hearts that have, have become and are staying soft and open, they're, they're cultivated. And he says, man, what I can do, what the seed of God can do in that kind of heart, man, he's saying it's 30, 60, 100 X. It's unbelievable the kind of growth that can happen in that person's heart. Let me ask you, what of the four is most true of the condition of your heart right now? Again, this isn't a fixed state. Uh, the answer to that question might be different next week or next month. But right now, as you sit, 4th of July weekend, of these four, calcified heart, crowded heart, conflicted heart, cultivated heart, which of those four is most true of the condition of your heart. Now, I, I want to be real practical. I actually want to give you three practices that can help you have and keep a cultivated heart. Uh, you guys love it when I'm practical and you're like, Pastor, please just like tell me what do I need to do? What do I need to do? So I want to be as practical as I can. I want to give you three practices that, that you can have and, and practice in order to keep a cultivated heart. And I've been intentional with the word practice. Uh, because these are things you actually have to practice. And, and so the first one is this, for you to practice, you're not going to like this, but for you to practice confession. Confession. In fact, if you're at a watch party right now, you can just boo the screen, right? No one likes confession. I, I've never met anyone that just shows up and says, you know what, it's just like my favorite thing. It's, I'm just into it. Uh, I don't know what's happened, but 2020, it's just my thing. I just love confession. Like when I have free time on my hands, I just, I just love to confess. In fact, I look for any Christian friend of mine and I just love confessing my sin to them. I don't think anyone has ever said that. But what is true is confession, practicing it because you never achieve it. Practicing confession is one of the most catalytic things that help our hearts stay soft to God. It helps us move towards or even remain as a man or woman, high school student, college student, to have that kind of cultivated heart. Practice confession. Let me ask it this way. What if you named to God where your heart has become hardened? Could you name it? 
God is full of love and mercy. He already knows anyway, for the record. But what if you said it out loud to God? One of my favorite quotes is from Lewis Smedes. And I think one of the reasons that some of your hearts have grown so hard is, is because of what others have done to you. Your heart has become like that trampled path. And I'm just wondering, would you confess forgiveness to another person? Lewis Mead says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Confessing forgiveness for someone else, it's one of the most catalytic things to help our heart stay or remain soft. If something was done to you or perhaps something you've done, uh, the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms 32, verse 3 and 4. Let me read this to you. This is incredible when it comes to confession. David writes this, when I refuse to confess my sin. Now just imagine this. I know you've never experienced this before in your life. I know you have never refused to confess your sin. So just imagine, use your imagination if you would. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. It's this incredible word picture of what it feels like to harbor unconfessed sin. Do you want to have a cultivated heart? Well, we need to practice confession. Secondly, we need to practice community. We need to practice community. And I just think everyone in the world is looking for love and on their pursuit, they end up bumping into Jesus and followers of Jesus. And some of you are watching this right now and you've been pursuing love and perhaps you've been looking for it in all kinds of places. You might even admit some of the wrong places, but on your journey of trying to find love and trying to find purpose and trying to find meaning, you are recognizing even right now in a drive or a back patio that you are bumping into the author of love, love himself, who is Jesus Christ. And Jesus, it's not only that he loves, but he is love. He's perfect love. He has rounded up all these followers all around the world and he has mandated to them that they would love as he has loved. And so I want you to know, Mission Church, we are a church that is full of imperfect people, but we are also a church that is full of forgiven people, people that have been forgiven by Jesus. And, and that's why we can just say to you, week in and week out, we want you to find a place here where you can belong. And of course, right now, it's not at the building. The building is shut down, but the body of Christ never has been shut down. Our church is wide open. Right now, we're creating places of belonging in all kinds of different places. What would it look like for you to practice community? And I love the word practice, again, because Jesus, he's invited us to, to bear his image in the world. Uh, community, Christian community, it's not something we achieve. It's something we practice. And I'm, I'm even wondering when I'm done talking, which will just be here in a few minutes, uh, what if you guys, when, when, once I'm done, you turn your chairs in and you guys have more conversation about the talk that you're hearing right now. You could even say, like, you can keep it shallow. You can just say, hey, what was one thing that stood out? You don't need to take a huge risk. Uh, if there's trust there, you can go a little bit deeper. You can even share with people. If the question is, hey, what's one way that you right now could use prayer this week? No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, my guess is you'd like prayer. And we can be that kind of community that prays for you. Would you practice community? Tommy Bowman, who is uh, the other uh, founding pastor, so we are the co-founding pastors. Uh, we are the co-knuckleheads that get to uh, provide leadership for this church. Uh, we've known each other our whole lives. And uh, Tommy knows uh, the lies that I can often believe. And it's just been so amazing. For years now, Tommy will, will practice community with me. And he will oftentimes remind me of a very, very specific thing, which is, John, it's not up to you. And it's amazing. He begins to preach the gospel to me. And a lot of times I'll return the favor and preach the gospel to him. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He says, you need to keep preaching the gospel to one another. If you are a follower of Jesus and you have other friends that are following Jesus, what if we did that? What if we practice community? And I'm not talking about just hanging out. That's a good place to start. But it's being even more intentional. It's speaking truth and life and beauty and meaning into the lives of others. How do we do this? How do we have a cultivated heart? Well, we practice confession. We practice community. And um, lastly, we, we practice, you're going to hate this one. We practice contentment. <laughs> and, and if you didn't like, you know, the first one, confession, you really don't like this one. Uh, what if we were to practice contentment? 
contentment. My question to you is, is Jesus enough? One of my favorite quotes from Corey Ten Boom is this, you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. She understood what it was like to uh, not only think about a cultivated heart, but she lived from that place, a heart that remained soft to God and she knew that Jesus was enough. Practice contentment. Um, my office is just on the other side of this wall. Oh, you can't see it, but there's a wall over here. And uh, on my office wall, I have a manifesto, uh, which is a fancy word for a paragraph I wrote. And I like to read my manifesto uh, every day because um, it's very similar. I haven't achieved these things, but I need to be reminded of these things. And one of the phrases in my daily manifesto is this. I, I, I thought that, uh, that I, could, I could share it with you. And it says this on my wall, everything I want in life is everything I already have in Christ. Everything I want in life. And guys, you got to understand who I am a striver, climber, achiever, hard worker. I never stop kind of guy. That's just the way I'm wired up. And this is on my wall. Everything I want in life is everything I already have in Christ. Why is that on my wall? Is it because I'm like great at that? No, it's actually because I'm terrible at that. And I need that reminder. I need to practice contentment on the daily. How about you? When I practice contentment, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. When I practice that, it's just amazing at how soft my heart gets to the things of God. My heart becomes like that soil in your garden that is ready to grow good things. I'd encourage you guys to practice these three things. Uh, some of you are, are wondering, perhaps, as I'm finishing, uh, is it worth it? Is it worth it, right? Uh, who likes to practice? Well, only those that would say that practice is actually worth in order to accomplish something that means so much to them. And, and so some of you are maybe asking right now, John, is this practice worth it? I mean, you're asking me to practice these three things of confession, community, and contentment. Is it worth it? And I would say, actually, yeah, I believe it is. Why? Because God grows good things. I'm not sure about you. I don't even know most of you. But my guess would be that you are into things like peace. You want a little bit of peace? You interested in that? How about, how about love? How about self-control? Not as much into that. Uh, how, how about gentleness? How, how about love? How about peace, gentleness, self-control? How about purpose? How about meaning? These are the things that God grows. And when I think about the outcome, when I think about the fruit, I'm just saying, hey, God, when does practice start? I'll be there. God grows good things. I want to close with this, uh, the parable of the sower. Uh, this is the title of this parable. Uh, another title of this parable could be the parable of the reckless farmer. It really could. Uh, the audience listening to this story in the first century, uh, as Jesus started and he's talking about farming and sowing seed, they're starting like this. I mean, I wasn't there. I'm just imagining, you know, they're probably like, all right, cool. He's going to tell a story. I get this. I've sowed seed before they're like nodding their heads and like, yeah, I'm with him. I'm with him. And then Jesus keeps going. And he says, this farmer, he begins to sow seed all over the place. And, and when, when Jesus starts telling this part of the story, I can just promise you their heads go from this to like, what? You could certainly rename this story, the parable of the reckless farmer. And here's why. In the first century, seed was so costly and so valuable. You couldn't just run out to Lowe's or, or Home Depot to get more seed. You did not waste seed in the first century. And the farmer here in, in Mark chapter 4 is very similar to the father in Luke chapter 15. Jesus describes a kind of farmer like they'd never seen. And he also describes a father like they had never seen. What is Jesus getting at? He is helping you understand the kingdom of God and God who is Christ the King. He's helping them and us understand that there is a farmer unlike any farmer you've ever seen. One that has come to earth, who is scattering seed all over the place, costly, precious seed. Why would he do that? Well, I think the answer is actually pretty simple. Love. Love. Love is why. 
I want you to imagine if you had four kids and each of your four children represented one of those four conditions of the heart that I just worked through. Would you hold out your love and say, hey, only until you have that fourth kind of condition of the heart, the cultivated heart, only then will you receive the seed of my love? No, if you're a parent, you're saying, no, I will love no matter what and whenever I will love. And Jesus is saying, listen, that farmer is reflected of a father. And the father, he loves you. I know you've come to believe all kinds of misconceptions about God, but I want you to know that he loves you. I want you to know that his love, some would even say is reckless. Some would even say is almost out of control that he would love like this. And I want you to know, until you take your last breath, he will keep scattering the seed that is the grace of God, that is the word of God, that is the love of God, hoping and longing that on that day, his seed will take root in a heart that is cultivated. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for your word. It's, it's amazing. Uh, your seed is so powerful. There's just no limit to what your seed can do when it comes in contact with a heart that is soft. And, and God, I, I'm asking for 30 60, 100x kind of peace and love and joy and kindness and self-control, purpose, meaning. I'm asking for that in my life. I'm asking that for, for all of our lives. And so we're gonna show up to practice. We're, we are, we're, we're gonna practice confession. It's worth it. We're gonna practice community. It's worth it. We're gonna practice contentment. It's worth it. And God, I thank you for how you sent Jesus Christ here to be a visible representation, the exact representation of the Father, whose love is reckless, whose love is unlimited, who does not run out of seed, and so you keep spreading seed. And God, I'm praying that even right now, that your seed would hit hearts that are soft and that are open. God, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you for this amazing story. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.